So we've been in a series studying the book of Revelation. And I don't know about you, but in the world, it's kind of crazy time, isn't it? Time is getting short. And I believe God directed us to share and to teach um, um, teach from the book of Revelation to help us know what's going to happen in the future. Um, so what we're going to do today, we're going to talk about the importance of enduring to the end. Everybody say, endure to the end. Endure to the end. God wants us to endure to the end. So today we're going to we're going to talk about the need to endure to the end. It's interesting that Jesus, many in many parables, he encouraged us to stay awake, pray, watch, and pray, endure to the end. So we're going to talk about the need of that, and we're going to talk about some keys and how we can how we can endure to the end. Um, first of all, I want to start start off talking about God's character. One of the biggest things I believe in the world is the world lies about God's character. And it's interesting, if you think back in Genesis 3, that's what Satan was doing to Adam and Eve. He was lying about God's character. So Satan was like, hey, the reason why you can't have the fruit is because God is trying to keep something from you because he's like that. And, you know, if you if you eat it, he just don't want you to be like him. But the interesting thing is they already was like God. They were made in his image. So the world loves, the devil loves to lie about God's character. And in terms of enduring to the end, I think it's important that we know God's character. Sometimes, I don't know about you, but when I'm going through trouble, I'm tempted to ask, Lord, why did you, why did you let this happen? <laughs> why did you let this happen? But we need to know that through all the things that we can go through, God is still good. Can I get an amen? amen. There's a scripture I want to share about that. It's in Matthew 12, starting verse 18. It says, Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased. This is a description of Jesus' uh, uh, job that he was going to do on the earth. I will put my spirit upon you, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised, here it is, a bruised reed he will not break. What does that mean? So I learned recently that a reed was a musical instrument that the shepherds would use to soothe and to help the sheep. So he's saying, and this musical instrument was so precious, so delicate, that if something was damaged on it, he wouldn't break it. That shepherd would spend hours and hours repairing it. And the same thing for us. When we are bruised, God doesn't want us broke, destroyed. He is so patient with us that he, and we are so valuable to him, that he will take the time to build us back together. And you know the interesting thing is, like that reed, it was used to encourage and to help soothe the, the sheep. He wants to use us to be that breath of fresh air to help bring healing to one another. Can I get an amen? amen? So when we're thinking about going through hard times, we need to realize that God is a good God. So we're talking about today enduring to the end. So I think the important thing to know is that Jesus and him being so good, he warns us before bad things happen. He wants to warn us. In the Bible, it says warning comes before destruction. And God is not trying to play game with us to catch us by surprise, to break us. He gives us warning. And this is what we're going to talk about this morning. So I have a, I think, a partly funny story of one of my experiences in the military. So when I joined the military, before I joined, I was super uh, 
afraid. And I, I don't think it's helped because I was watching Forrest Gump. <laughs> and I was like, man, if it's like that. <laughs> but I was watching Forrest Gump, I was like, I don't know if I want to go to the military. But I went to the military and I, and I, and I went through with it. And I think the Army was playing a trick on us. I got to where I was going to go, and they started us off with a reception. We went to the reception center, and they were feeding us pancakes. <laughs> they fed us eggs, and like, what kind of eggs do you want? I was like, oh man, yeah, can you have some cheese on it? And it was so, I was like, man, the military is great. <laughs> oh man, I didn't mean, oh, this was a great decision. And they did that, and they just whined and dined us for a week. And I'm like, this is wonderful. <laughs> and then they're like, hey, so you're about to get shipped off to go to basic training. I was like, oh, man, it's going to be great. You know, I'm sure. Wonderful. <laughs> And then I should have got the fresh clothes when they, when they when the cattle, you know, the 18 wheeler with a cattle car and the trailer in the back. <laughs> and we had to ship, we had to get in there. We're like, we have our dog back. And we're like, oh, this doesn't seem right. <laughs> and then the, then the drill sergeants, it was about three drill sergeants went in there with us and they weren't smiling at us like they were before. <laughs> they were, I'm like, what's wrong with this dude? I mean, you, so. We're, we're driving, and then we're about to pull up to our barracks. Now, I'm telling you, I don't know if I'm exaggerating, but it was like 20 drill sergeants, me money, yelling, get out of the car, get out. I'm like, oh my goodness, this is terrible. <laughs> and then, so we had this duffel bag, and I had all some of my civilian clothes and some of my, all my stuff, and they made us hold the duffel bag like this and dump it out and then they wanted to inspect everything we had so we had to hold a duffel bag as we were putting everything in and I seen a grown man cry I said you know what this is bad but I'm not going to cry <laughs> I'm not going to cry I'm not going to give up my man I'm sorry. so he's like he was crying I was like it was bad was, I would say that was probably one of the worst days of my life <laughs> except the day in basic training where I had to use the bathroom and I was we were on like this 10 mile 10 mile rug march and there was no bathrooms because we, we couldn't you know we couldn't stop so that was a bad day but anyway this day <laughs> this day was bad I mean people were yelling at me I'm, I'm, I, and I thought about giving up and then the first day we're already terrified. <laughs> we lay down and go to sleep. And then probably around 4 o'clock, mind you, I've never seen 4 a.m. before in my whole life, in my entire life. I've never seen it on the clock. And somebody came in there, a drill sergeant came in, you know those tin cans? The old-fashioned tin cans? They came in there, boom! Get up! I'm like, what? I'm like, you know, there was a hundred ways you could have woke us up, but you didn't have to choose that one. So, so anyway, mind you to say, I'm like, I made the wrong decision, and I got offended. They're treating us that way. But this is the same thing, I believe, with, with things that's coming. As we read here, you're going to see Jesus saying, I don't want to... You, I don't want you to be surprised. Because if this stuff surprises you, it could tempt you to give up. It could tempt you to not want to endure to the end. I really believe that God wants to use us to send out a warning. Because I believe there's a lot of Christians, there's a lot of people that are asleep. Flat out asleep. And when things really start getting hard, that's the whole parable about the ten virgins. The one five virgins had the oil, meaning they were prepared, they were awake. The other five weren't prepared. And when the trouble hit, they weren't ready. So we're gonna talk about 
getting ready. Here, here's, here's the warning. I read this scripture before. Ezekiel 33, 6. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet so that the people are not warned, and the second and the sword comes and takes any one of them, that person is taken away in his iniquity. But his blood I will require at the watchman's hand. So I take it really seriously. I believe God gave us, he gave me a job to warn us of things to come. And it's not to be afraid. It's to be fearless and be confident that God's going to be with us. But if we're asleep, and spiritually somebody come and throw a candle, ah! we're not going to be ready like we should be. So here's some of the main scriptures that we're, we're sharing today. Matthew 24, 9 through 14. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another, and many false prophets will arise and, and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. You know what else, you know what I think about that scripture? That's not just talking about the world. I believe that's talking about believers. Because of lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testament to all nations. And then the end will come. Here's a revelation. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And here, up next, there's the Greek word here for endurance. And it means uh, the capacity to continue to bear up under difficult circumstances. And let me just talk about the elephant in the room. I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm preaching to the choir because you guys know but there is some teaching out there that's saying, I, you know, I heard of a famous, well-known prophet person saying that, you know, we've already seen the worst of days and things are just going to get better and, you know, things are going to be awesome. I don't believe that's true. There's a teaching out there saying that, you know, Christians really shouldn't go through bad, it's, you know, because we're not appointed to wrath. But they're getting wrath and tribulation mixed up. Tribulation, Jesus said, hey, in this world, you're going to have tribulation. You're going to have pressure. You're going to have things. You're gonna, things are going to challenge you. But that's way different from God's wrath. And we, we, had, a whole, we had a whole sermon talking about God's wrath. Um, never heard about a sermon talking about God's wrath. But we talked about God's wrath. And what we saw with God's wrath that's going to happen in the future, guess what it entails? God throwing things from heaven, pouring out things from heaven, a third of the earth burning up, all of the, all of the vegetation burning up, uh, demonic forces being released to torment. There's one of them, there's a scorpion-type locust thing that went out to uh, torment people for five months. That's the wrath of God. We, you know what? And we're hearing a lot about we're going to destroy the earth with global warming. And I, I, I think you were telling me about the 15 minute cities in Europe based on, I, I think, for climate control stuff, right? So yes. they're basing, basing their they're, they can't leave beyond 15 minutes of the house walking distance? Or? Walking. walking distance. And it's based on the supposed carbon climate change, which carbon is technically 0.04% of our so, environment. So let me tell you, we will not destroy the earth. Nope. You know why? Because the Bible said it. In 2 Peter, it says the earth is going to be reserved for God's judgment. Who's going to destroy it? God is going to destroy it. So this, this is a whole false doctrine that's, that's 
causing the enemy to gain more and more control over nations. Anyway, that's I think that was a my a soapbox right there. But it's crazy. There's a lot of people believe. So this is what's happening. I'm, I'm just gonna just go with the flow. Is that all right? Yeah. God, God, his intention for mankind was to rule over the earth, to have dominion over the animals, over the earth. We were the kings of this earth under God's authority. Now, what's happening is people are promoting that the environment is more important than humans and that the environment should be our you know, I was watching Jurassic Park. I'm, I'm going to get off this, but I was watching the newest Jurassic Park, and it was talking about, um, and man doesn't have dominion. And it basically said the environment has authority over mankind. This was like in the beginning credits. So I just wanted to share that. There's just that false doctrine out there. Don't believe it. Don't get sucked into that. But let's go back to how we need to endure to the end. First Thessalonians 5, 1 through 4. Here's one quote, though, before we get there. I think it was Joe Lewis that said, it's a punch that you didn't see coming that knocked you out. So God wants us to be ready. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 4. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have any, anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, while people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, check this out, this is for all of us, but you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to what? God doesn't want us to be surprised. Here's some Greek words, meanings of the word surprise there. It means to seize something and make it one's own, to lay hold of, seize with eagerness. Properly signifies to lay hold of, of, of something and, and to possess it. God does not want us to be surprised. 1 Thessalonians 5, 5 through 6, for you are all children of the light, light of the day. We are not of the night or the darkness. And that word skotos is where we get the word scoliosis, twisted, evil realm. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. So let me ask you a question. Who was Paul writing to right there? He was talking to believers, right? So he said, don't sleep. And I looked up that word sleep there. Uh, I'm not going to try to pronounce it. Katadio or anyway. This is what it means. It's a person that has carnal indifference to spiritual things as a believer. And here's another thing. It's a condition of insensibility to divine things involving com conformity to God's will. A condition of insensibility to divine things involving conformity to God's will. So can a Christian be asleep? Let me give you an example of what it means to be asleep. So I, I grew up as a believer. I told you about when I went to the military. I was actually on fire for the Lord when I was in the military. Uh, when I went to basic training at first, and then I went to learn my job in Fort Lee, Fort Leisure, um, Virginia. I heard the Lord say, you see those people over there? Don't go over there. So here's something for, for kids. What's up, brother? Um, I heard the Lord say, don't go over there to those people. Don't go hang out with them. You know what I said? Here's the lesson for all your kids. I said, oh, it'll be all right. It'll be all right. And I went with them and hung out with them. And it wasn't, it was probably four years before I recovered. And, and during that time, guess what? I was asleep. 
I was not sensitive to God's will. And in fact, it was so bad that I was taught to pray for my food. I, I didn't even have the courage to pray for my food because I knew when I got up that I was going to do something that was contrary to God's will. I was asleep. And it's interesting, we're talking about end times, we're talking about the rapture. One thing that got me, got me, um, God used to wake me up, I actually had a dream that I was left behind. I called my mom. I was like, huh? A warning. It was a warning. I called my mom. And I was like, she wouldn't answer. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> I know my mom. If, if, if the rapture's happened, she's it's a call. It, it was she didn't answer the phone until like 6:30. I probably started calling at 12. I could not get a hold of her. She finally answered the phone. I was like, oh mama. I'm so glad to hear your voice. <laughs> She's like, what's wrong, baby? I was like, oh, man, I thought I, I actually thought I got, I was left behind. And I need to get my life straight. She's like, find a church, baby. Go, I mean, get your, get your stuff together. Get in the church. I was like, yes, ma'am. <laughs> but it, it helped. I, I mean, hey, you know what I, mean? I, I felt like I was left behind. And I believe that was God's mercy to get my attention. God doesn't want us to be asleep. 1 Thessalonians, starting verse 5, verse 7. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who are drunk, are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath. He, he's talking to believers. God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Um, so as in my study, there's 10 things I believe, because there is a teaching out there. I know I'm teaching to the choir. I'm preaching to the choir. But there is a doctrine out there that's saying, oh, you know, the church won't go to, through tribulation. The church won't be here during the great tribulation. And here's the thing. There is tribulation going on in the world right now. You know that? America just has been so blessed. I mean, you go to China, that's tribulation. You go to parts of India, you go to Saudi Arabia, they're having tribulation. If you were asked them, well, we're already in a tribulation. And we, like I said, we've been so blessed that we have not experienced tribulation now. But here's the thing. Tribulation is already happening. I, th I think that was Suzanne that said that probably every five minutes somebody dies because of their profession of faith. Every five minutes, somebody dies because they're a Christian, because they held fast. There's, see, what's going to happen in the Great Tribulation is going to be all over the world. That same type of persecution that's going on in China and other areas is going to be all over the world. So here's 10 indicators believers can and will go through the Great Tribulation. I have, I have a whole bunch of scripture. Just bear with me, because I don't want... This is not LT saying it. What's the best way to interpret scripture? Other scripture, right? So we're going to read some. Pretty exciting. First one. Number one. The understanding of wheat and tares parable and the timing of the gospel being preached to the whole world. All right. Here's Matthew 13, 30. Let both grow together into the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in, in bundles to be to burn, to be burned, but gather the wheat into the barn. That's actually a, a an example of the rapture, and it's also an example of people that's being that's gonna go to hell. But it's a picture of the rapture, people going to be with Jesus forever. Matthew 24, 14, 
In this gospel of the kingdom will be preached through the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So let me ask you a question just really quick. Who's going to help preach the gospel to help the end to come? Um, like I said, that's true. Who is it going to be? Do you think? Christians? Christians? All right. Let's read something. I found something that I've never seen before. Track with me. 14, Revelation 14, 6 through 20. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal, with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on the earth. So we have an angel here flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on the earth to every nation and tribe and language and people. Man, doesn't that sound like what Jesus just said? And he said with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth and sea and springs of water. Another angel, a second Followed saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon, the great she was she who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual sexual immorality, and another angel, a third, following them. You know what that means? Babylon is fallen, you know what that means? Babylon represents all the false religions in the world. It represents it represents rebellion against God. But it's gonna come a time that the Antichrist is gonna say, no other religion is going to be allowed. He's going to say, worship me. And an angel, a third, following him, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast in his image and, and receives a mark on his forehead or in his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, pour full through strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire, sulfur, in the presence of the holy angels, in, his, in the presence of the Lamb. So here, right here, is talking about the great tribulation. The Antichrist is going to be trying to force people to take the mark of the beast. And the smoke of the torment, and, and, and the, this angel was saying, anybody who takes this is going to be, is going to, is going to experience eternal damnation. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day and night. These worshippers of the beast in his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is a call, here it is, for the endurance of the saints. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. So this is talking about, hey, this is bad times. This is, this is the great tribulation. The Antichrist is going to be trying to force a lot of Christians to take the mark. Jesus is saying, blessed are those who endure. That they may rest from their labors. Man, I can't wait to be with Jesus. I don't know about y'all. <laughs> Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud. So here we go. We got the tribulation going. So let me just zoom out to, to talk about what we've kind of shared. So we talked about the wrath of God, and we saw that the wrath of God, that here's one difference between tribulation and wrath. Wrath has vengeance with it. There's going to come a day that God is going to bring vengeance on the earth because of rebellion. And that vengeance is going to hit the devil square in his head too. Then I look and behold a white cloud and seated on the cloud like a son of man with a golden crown on his head. And they get, remember the thing about the, the harvest in the scripture that Jesus was talking about? Another angel came out of the temple calling with a loud voice, him who sat on the cloud Put your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, for the harvest, the, the earth is fully ripe. So he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. What is that? That's the rapture. And another angel came out from the altar, and, and the angel who has authority over fire, and he called with a loud voice, to the one who had the sharp sickle, put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the great harvest of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the. So that's the people that's going 
to the to hell. You see, it's the same thing in 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 Matthew. It's talked about the rapture, and then this other situation is when the people that were going to hell was going to hell, and the wine press was trodden outside the city with blood flowed the wine press as high as a horse bridle for a hundred and sixty. Uh, status. So what that's talking about that right before Jesus comes back, what's going to happen? We're going to talk about it a little later. There's going to be a whole lot of all the nations of the world are going to attack Israel. And, and when Jesus comes back, he's going to he's going to put it on those 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 armies that surrounded Israel. We'll talk about that later. So here's the second thing. The use of the word elect in Matthew 24. As you sat on the, as as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, "Tell us when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming of the end of the age?" And Jesus answered them, "See that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet." For nation will rise up against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but, but the beginnings of the birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will rise and lead many astray because of lawlessness. Will be, will be increased, the love of many will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be will proclaim throughout the whole world as a testimony to the angels, and then the end will come. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel uh, standing in the holy place, that's going to be the Antichrist in Israel um, doing this false sacrifice. Then let those who are Judea flee to the mountains. Something we haven't really gotten to this, but the Antichrist is going to make some kind of agreement with Israel of peace. It's going to be peace for three and a half years. At the end of those three and a half years, the Antichrist is going to break his promise. That's when he's going to influence nations to come attack Israel. And this is what Jesus is saying to all Israelites or people that's in Israel at the time. This is what he, Jesus is telling them to do. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is in the housetop not go down to, to take what is in his house. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to, to take the cloak. And the last for women who are pregnant and for those days who nursing infants in those days. Pray that your flight may not be in winter or Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now. And, and no and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, ekletos, those who will be uh, those days were cut short. Then, if anyone says to you, "Look, here is the Christ," or "There he is," do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the See, I have told you beforehand. So if they say to you, look, he's, he's in the wilderness, do not go out. If they, they say, look, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning, there we go. For as the lightning comes from the east, shines as uh, for as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Whatever the corpse is there, the vultures will be gathered immediately after the, here it is. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give light. That's when Jesus comes back, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of earth will mourn. By the way, we're going to be with him when he's coming back right there. All the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will, here it is again, send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. What does that sound like? 
The rapture. When is it after? It's after the, the tribulation. When we're talking about the word, 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10, but you are a chosen people, eklatos, it's the same word. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness. The same word is used. Elect, electos, it means to the chosen out ones. So I believe that elect, electos, is the same word, it's, it's similar to the word uh, ecclesia, means the church is the called out ones. So that's the second one. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 through 18. For this will declare to you by a word from the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven and cry uh, of a command with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then who we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so will we always be with the Lord. Always. always be with the Lord. Matthew 24, 32, 31, then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power uh, and great glory, and he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds. So I believe that word elect is, is significant. Number three. Let's go to number three. The timing of the Antichrist appearance. 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 4. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or, or a spoken word, or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has already come. So in 2 Thessalonians, over 2,000 years ago, there are false teachers going around saying that Jesus had already come back. So Paul is saying, hey, he has not already come back. In fact, he will not come back until then. This, he says, either by a to the fact that the day of the Lord has already come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless when? The rebellion comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of, of worship so that he takes a seat in the temple of God proclaiming himself to be God. Number three. So it's saying there that Jesus is not going to come back until the great apostasy and until the Antichrist is revealed. Number four, the difference between the words tribulation and wrath. 1 Thessalonians 5, 8 through 11. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's look at the word tribulation been translated over 20 times and it means pressure, it means to be squeezed, it means to be pressed, it means affliction. Here is wrath, the definition for wrath, it is an abiding, set, abiding, settled, and habitual anger that includes in its scope the purpose of revenge. Number five, the description of the timing of the day of the Lord. Okay. To, I believe to understand when Jesus is coming back, it's important to understand the day of the Lord. And scripture tells us what the day of the Lord looks like. Job 2. Let's start. We'll just, we'll just read that 30. And I will show wonders in the heavens on the earth, blood and fire, columns of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day the Lord comes, and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, for in Mount Zion and the Jerusalem there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those who the Lord calls. Acts 2, 14 through 21. In the last days it shall be 
God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. How do we know that God's already done that? And your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens. Here's the great the day of the Lord. I will show wonders in heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day, and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Matthew 24, 29 to 31. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. Does that sound like the day of the Lord? Yeah. I'm not losing y'all. And the moon will be not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call and gather up his elect. So, I, I believe one good way to understand end times and the revelation and when Jesus is coming back for us to be prepared is to understand the seals. I know there's a slide there, but I just zipped past it. There's in the Bible, they have Jesus, it has the the Olivet Discourse. That's when Jesus was teaching on the Mount of Olives. And the disciples came to him asking about the end times. So in Matthew 24 and 25, Luke 21 and Mark 13 is descriptions of the Olivet Discourse. And here's something interesting. You want to know a secret about knowing what's going to happen in the end times? If you understand the, the Olivet Discourse, and you, and you understand that the six, the seven seals that's in Revelation 6 match perfectly with the Olivet Discourse. So, seal number one. Y'all remember? What's seal number one from Revelation 6? The white horse, right? It represents extreme deception. Seal number two. It represents extreme war. Seal number three. It represents extreme famine and, and inflation. The Bible tells us that at that time, for one quart of wheat, it's going to be $200. Seal number four. Extreme persecution. Seal number five, extreme outcry from heaven saying, God, when are you going to revenge the, our blood? These are people that, that died in the tribulation. Seal six is when Jesus comes back and when we're with him. Seal seven, extreme wrath God pouring out on earth. So here, right, just really quick, here are the, 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 the seals. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked and behold, there was a great earthquake and the sun be became black and sat off. The full moon became like blood and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree sh uh, sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll, then being rolled up and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth and the great ones. And doesn't that sound like Matthew? Slaves and free, hidden themselves in caves and among the, the, the rocks and the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who seeks seated on the throne in the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath, wrath has come, and who can stand? Luke 21, 25 to 28. And there will be signs of sun and moon and stars, and on the earth distress, nations and perplexity. Because of the roaring of the sea and the waves, people fainting with fear, with foreboding, and what is coming on the world, for the powers of heaven will be shaken, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now, when these things begin to take place, straighten up, raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing up. Number six. 
time of demonic and global attack on the nation of Israel. In Daniel 9.27, I'll, I'll talk about that later, but that just explains the, the, the seven-year period of the Great Tribulation. Um, let's go to Matthew 24, 15-21. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the ones who is on the housetop not go down to talk, take what is in his house. And let the one who's in the field not turn back to take play, take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant. So right there, that is talking about uh, armies and people are going to attack the nation of Israel. Luke 21 is talking about the same thing right there. Let's just go ahead and skip to Revelation 12, 7 through 17. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, and he was defeated, and there was, was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the dragon was thrown down, the ancient serpent, who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole nations, he was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in the heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power of the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ has come. For the accuser of the brethren have been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of the testimony. For they love him, love not their lives and even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell on, on, in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short and when the dragon was saw that he had been thrown down to earth he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child who's the woman Israel but the woman was given the two wings of great of the, of, of the great eagle so that she might fly so somewhere in there Israel is going to be protected somehow somewhat uh, to the place where she is to be nourished for a time and times and a half a time, that's three and a half years. The serpent poured out water like a river out of his mouth after his woman, after the woman, which is Israel, to sweep her away with a flood. But the earth came to, to the help of the woman, or Israel, and the earth opened his mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. Then the dragon uh, because uh, furious with the woman, he went off to make war on the rest of her offspring and those who keep the commandments of God. Who is that? That's Christians. Number seven. What the seals teach us. And we already talked about that. In Revelation 6, it talks about seals 1 through 6. Revelation 14, it talks about uh, seal 6. Revelation 8 through 9, it talks about seal 7. Um, number eight, the timing of the great falling away. We already talked about that. Number nine, a special event in heaven. Revelation 7, 9 through 14. After this, I looked and behold, a great multitude of no one could number for every nation from all tribes and peoples, languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and the Lamb, and all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and for the poor living creatures. They fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped, saying, Amen. Blessed glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know, he said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And just number 10, present day persecution and circumstances. There's already per all types of pers per persecution all over the world. I'm sorry, I know I zipped through a lot of that kind of that stuff. Hope I didn't lose you guys. But the point is this. In Scripture, the Bible teaches us that Christians may go through the Great Tribulation. You know, I was talking to a friend a while back, and, um, and he was telling me about another person, 
And they're basically saying, I don't believe we're going to go through the great tribulation. I don't believe we're going to go through the tribulation. Mm -hmm. And my friend said, oh, um, so if somehow you guys do, you do go through the tribulation, would that affect your faith? You know what that person said? It would. Mm -hmm. It would. Because they don't believe they're, they're going to go through any trouble. And I believe a lot of, some people who don't understand and don't, don't get this warning are going to, it's a chance they can get surprised <clears throat> and they can get offended after. You know, the Lord says in the Bible that a lot of people will be offended at Jesus in the last days. And I think one of the big reasons why people are going to be offended is because they're going to have this mentality that says, we are not supposed to go through trouble. We are not supposed to go through bad times. Well, I don't believe that's true. I know I read a lot of scripture um, and uh, that talks about certain things in the Bible that says, you know what? There's a good chance Christians are right smack dab in the middle of the great tribulation. But there's no reason for us to be worried. Can I get an amen? amen. We, we need to be fearless. We need to have faith. And next week, we're going to talk about some things that in a deeper way of how to make sure we prepare ourselves to really endure to the end. 1 Corinthians 15, 15, 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that the, the Lord knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. So just really quickly, really quickly, here's four things that we can do. I already talked about this before. Four things we can do to make sure that we are ready to endure. First one, four S's. We need to spend time in prayer. How many know there's, there's power in prayer? The second S, study God's word. How many know there's power in studying God's word? Third S, surrender to God, not to the world. And the fourth S, we need to spend time in koinonia, or we need to spend time in community. I believe it was in Hebrews it says, don't forsake the assemblies of yourself, as some people are. Continue to come together, because there's power in coming together. And I have the scriptures there. I have a video I want to share. I know a lot of us go through hard times, and maybe some of us are going through hard times now. But we need to know that God always has the upper hand. So let's look at this video. In the museum in the Louvre, I don't know how many of you have been there, the picture is called Checkmate. The devil's sitting on this side. There's a chessboard, and there's a guy sitting on the other side. And the guy sitting on the other side has his hand on his head like this. And he's like in desperation. And as they were taking a tour through the Louvre, there had been a group of, 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 of athletes, and particularly ch world champions, that were being given a special tour. And in the tour was the world chess champion. And he comes walking by the picture. And the guy's explaining to him, this is a picture of an artist rendering of somebody who lost the battle with the devil. And so the group moved on to the next picture to see something else. But the world chess champion, he stayed there. And he just kept looking at the picture. And soon they noticed that he was not with the group. And so the tour guide came back and said, we, we, we moved on, are you, are you coming? He said, well, I've been looking at this picture. And the guy said, yeah, he said, it's, it's called Checkmate. The devil's laughing, the man's lost. And he said, yeah, he said, I've been noticing that. He said, but while I've been standing here, I've kept looking at the picture. I'm, I, I've, got, I've got a problem. And he said, well, what, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a world champion chess player. And I spend my life playing chess and normal people don't always see 
what a world champion chess player sees. He says, but when y'all walked off, I looked at the devil laughing and I looked at the man in desperation. But he said, I noticed something on the chessboard. He said, either they're going to have to change the painting or they're going to have to change the name. And the guy said, well, why are they going to have to do that? He said, well, you know, I'm a world champion chess player. And he said, when I observed the board, I found out the king still has one more move. I come to tell somebody today, you believe you've been cornered. You believe everything is gone and nothing has got any hope. But the king still has one more move. In the fullness of time, God sent his son. I dare you to declare it. The king has one more move. He has one more move over my finances. He has one more move over my marriage. He has one more move over my kids. It is not over. You know what? It's a possibility that we're going to go through hard times in our lifetime, or it could be in our kids' lifetime. It's, it's possible that we are going through hard times right now, and we feel like giving up. But you know what? Like this preacher said, the king always has one more move. What is it saying? The king, Jesus Christ, is always in control. Can I get an amen? amen? So you know what? Here's the thing. We need to keep that in our mind when we're going through trouble. Jesus says, endure to the end. One way it's going to help us to do that is to know that Jesus, even though all types of stuff is crashing around us, we need to know that Jesus is in control and he always has one more. Amen? Amen. amen.